Okay, well, welcome to the podcast, Miss Tweedy's Parents. This is not about my parents, though. This is me chatting with the parents that have crossed my path along the way as a piano teacher for close to 40 years and an early childhood teacher for close to 20. I've learned that we all have a lot to say about parenting. It's pretty fun to sit down and chat with uh, people about it. Today, I'm chatting with Bethany. She is such a wise and soulful woman who has found a completely new person in herself, in her role as a mother. We talk a lot about that identity crisis that can challenge career women after having children as we redefine our roles, and we try to figure out what contributing looks like for us and how we feel about it. Anyway, have a listen. Bethany, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, thanks for having me. So you are an interesting person for me to spend some time with because I knew you first as a fellow musician. Uh, You're a fantastic opera singer and a wonderful teacher, and we worked together. And so I got to know you that way. Then you had babies. And then I think somewhere along there, you were also interested in doing some early childhood teaching. So we kind of interacted in that way. Yeah, no, I'm excited to just chat. We haven't had the opportunity just like as people and friends to do this, really, because it's always sort of centered around working relationships yeah. and the kids. And yeah, this is nice. And yes, I, I should mention in recent years, you've been coming to classes with your little ones. So definitely we do the, you know, you get a third of the way into a conversation and then your Chasing child needs something. Up, and I mean, or, you know, yeah. you got to make sure everyone's, you know, alive. Now tell us about your family. So uh, I have two boys. Phoenix will be five this coming May. Oh, already? I know. Oh my God. <laughs> and Lennon turned two last month in January. You have two boys and a husband and yes. a male dog. <laughs> and are your cats both males as well? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sensing have, a theme here. <laughs> I think about that all the time. One of the cats is female. <laughs> so we have a little sisterhood in the house. <laughs> but yes, there is a lot of male energy in my house. <laughs> well, man, if anyone can handle it, it is you. Because to me, you bring just such a calm strong presence like strength is definitely something that comes to mind when I think of you and um and you teach singing and piano and you are well a doula which we're going to talk about too and you're a mother and a woman I admire but you're also an athlete and you do like intense stuff like spartan races and extreme marathons am I right like you do the crazy stuff and mountain stuff I guess it depends on your definition of that. <laughs> I know there's but... <laughs> always someone who goes further, right? Yeah. We always think, oh, no, I'm not like that. But right. uh, you go further than me, I guess, is the point. My husband is really into trail running, and he's the one who does, like, the super long distances. Yes, right. Um, yeah, but I I mean, I've done my share of half marathons and I try to triathlon and stuff like that. We do a lot of hiking. Um and we're always outdoors with our kids. Right. And then we we used to, in our single days, do a lot more of those sort of like obstacle racing things. And I've done like the extreme end of those, of like the 30 kilometer yes. sort of yeah. six, seven hour ones. Oh my God. Oh, I cried in that one. So. <laughs> I did it twice I though. I cried so in a 6K. <laughs> <laughs> it must have done something for me because I went back. But um, we've sort of scaled back our, not scaled back, maybe reframed our activities because of the kids because we want to just spend time with them you can't really do that stuff with them it's interesting so your husband Eli is also a singer so mm-hmm. you're a very unusual couple because you're both singers but you're both super duper outdoorsy and active which you know sometimes you'll run across musicians where you see one but to have both with that in common <laughs> and and the thing is I don't think people realize because they seem so different but you do live in extremes to be an opera singer or to be a, a concert pianist. And you do live in extremes to do big races. And mm-hmm. and it, it, they're not that different. And you have goals and you have to work towards the goals and you have to understand the process. That is such a good point. I've actually never thought about it that way. <laughs> Me neither. But that, that is so true. And I think I'm always that kind of a person who's in pursuit of a goal. And that's certainly been formed by my training as a singer and things like that. Um, But I think in terms of 
relating it to what we do physically and actively as a family or even before that, um, Eli and I kind of discovered that together, oh, which is neat. interesting. Like he was physical in like he went to the gym and I did not. It, it basically started with a competition. I was like, I can run more than you in a month. Like I can do that. Right. And then I, I, think, <laughs> I came very close. He runs a lot. but <laughs> And then I just liked it and how it made me feel. And then we started sort of expanding what we did together and that became an option, right? Things like that. And then we just wanted to do more and more and more. And I think that's the same. You're right with, um, performing <laughs> and even just sort of the chasing of excellence that there is in music, Yes, which can be kind of a burden. Absolutely. Um, and can be a burden otherwise in your life, of course. Yes. But it's really apparent in music. Yes. Well, but, yeah, you either get the part or you don't. Right? Yeah. You're, you either sang the note nicely or you, you cacked it. And often yeah. if you cack it, it's in front of a crowd. Right. And <laughs> even so, like, there, and this is something I say to my students all the time. Now, I feel like I t- I'm teaching myself as I teach. Yes. Nobody is perfect. We can't, as a, from a singing perspective anyways, we can't sing a note perfectly ever because our instrument is the human body. Right. You know, and that, that we're just not robots. Which is not meant to be perfect. Oh, wow. Yeah. We have so, gosh, we're, there's so many directions we can go. And I love it. We we haven't even talked, uh, touched really upon parenting. And yet <laughs> yeah. I feel like everything we're talking about has parenting themes to it. And mm. and I'm surely to be so goal driven. Um, well, and understanding the, the long term commitment and process of getting Realizing your goals, you must mm-hmm. apply this to parenting in some way, shape, or form. Does that fit? <laughs> yes, totally. And I mean, it's something that you don't think about from my own perspective in the minutia of things, right? No, for sure. Um, but when you zoom out, you're always thinking about how one action or one conversation or one guideline or correction or act of love or whatever leads to the next and then creates a person right or guides the formation of a person and the choices that they make for themselves and my kids are so little but it's probably too much to be thinking about that stuff all the time yes that's kind of how I function anyways Right. And it definitely sort of bleeds into how I parent. It's the being intentional thing, I guess, that everyone is always sort of harping on, but maybe a little bit more neurotic than that. Well, (laughs) it's it's a hot topic. And I think it's hard when you're a goal driven person and and perhaps um, before children accustomed to having control over your level of achievement. It's hard when being intentional, not to bring that same intensity to it and end up pushing or creating unrealistic goals. Totally. And like, that's a huge thing that I never want to see manifested in my children. Oh my God. And the person that I was before I had kids, not that I didn't love her, but I didn't really like her that much. And looking back, especially I was just so hyper-focused on that sort of pursuit of excellence and perfectionism that I, it was all that mattered. I, all I did was work and it brought me a lot of sort of satisfaction and fulfillment and was sort of the framework of my identity. But I was so stressed all the time. And I just thought that that was how you live. Oh my God. (laughs) And having kids really broke me open in a lot of ways um, to sort of force me to let go of that control for a really excellent reason, right? What you're talking about, about not wanting to impose any of that on my kids, wanting them to become their own people and know that that was okay and that they were safe to do that. And they were safe to experiment and make mistakes along the way and change (laughs) and not be held to the standards that I held myself to. And I think part of, and I mean, after my, I'm getting really in, in there now, but after my second child, I, um, I got diagnosed with postpartum depression. Okay. Which I just want to say, like, yeah. we all talk about it, but when you're a super high achiever and you have a your c- certain ego level and goal drivenness and you're, you find yourself depressed, it can, it can be a double whammy of a blow because yes. you're not that person. Oh, 100%. Because that's how I defined who I was, right? Of yes. always achieving and always um, being productive, 
is how I like to frame it when mm. I think about it and when I talk to my therapist. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like I'm not enough if I'm not doing something that somehow contributes to the day or yeah, someone's life, if right. not my own. Or that checks some sort of a item off a list or that progresses something that I'm working on or that looks like success to the world. To have that drive and and commitment to goal and and bring it into parenting. And then I can't imagine, because it sounds like you you continued with your first, you know, oh, with yeah. new goals, wanting to be more holistic, but then you had the carpet pulled out from under you when you had the second. I think if it's your first, you can kind of maybe go with it a little more. But when you've got a a little guy wanting you to play and be fun and be that that same bright shining light of a mother. Yeah, I think that's such a good way to think about it. And you're right with my first. I mean, I was going to board meetings at like three months postpartum. I didn't allow myself to shift in ways that I had to with my second because I didn't have a choice and my life was in a different spot anyways, work wise and career wise. But I really tried to hold on to that identity that I had before. And I think I was able to for a while, but then sort of serendipitously the company closed. Right. (laughs) A few months after I came back from that leave. It was an imposed reset. I would say. Honestly, it was. And it really made me go like, Oh, this is actually contributed in a lot of negative ways to my mental health and my work-life balance and my ability to parent in the way that I want to. I mean, my son was little still. He was not even a year old yet, but it was at that moment where I started to actually feel those feelings a little bit about how like, oh, I'm not able to be as productive or as successful you're, in the way that I've always known yeah. about like being a, in a leadership role in a community organization and being um, someone on stage and yeah. And, 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 right. This, this level of <clears throat> success and value that you imposed, I'm uh, telling the listeners when she said successful, she did air quotes, which <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I totally, I think we all understood it. But the point is, and, and I relate to this too, although I, I had an er- pre child experience with the car accident that did the same thing, mm. pulled the carpet out from under this career I'd worked so hard to build and was mm. really a very ugly person in. Mm. Um, judgmental, catty, competitive, but very successful. Yeah. I liked what you said about holding on to your identity Mm -hmm. because I think there is a period of time before we have children, we're determined not to lose it when we're pregnant. You know, we we talk about how, oh yeah, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And then we have the children and it's like, we're just waiting to get it back. And we start like holding on to it, except we're not the same person anymore. Not at all. And I think after my second, I mean, everyone has a different experience. Like, I think we were talking about this the other day, actually, that I've seen friends of mine who, of course they go through the shift, but they come out the other side looking like the same person, at least outwardly. (laughs) (laughs) Seeming. Yeah. Yeah, Seeming is a better way to say it. But I, I don't, I feel feel in moments that I don't even recognize that person and it feels like okay like that feels yes. right yes. and it was only through the experience that I had with my second when I realized so there's lots that happened in between that with sort of going down the path of becoming a birth doula but with that knowledge that I had at that point I was able to recognize what was going on with me in terms of my postpartum depression yeah. super early yeah and was able to seek out help and, you know, be medicated and go to therapy in ways that I needed to and sort of focus on the things that I knew I needed back in my life. Like running was a big thing. I did a half marathon that year because I was like, I have to do this because I'm not going to survive. Mental health. Yeah. 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 And like there was at least one, if not more moments where like, I may not have sur- like actually survived. Do you know, you know what I mean? Before I, I do like yeah. physically survived yes. before I was like, this is not okay. And then obviously yes. through getting help, I'm like, I'm in a great place now. And I, I'm thankful for what I learned in that experience, I guess is a better way right. to say it. Um, Because that's where I really accepted the fact that I am not the person that I was. And that is so fine. 
And there are so many ways in my life that I can still get that feeling of being valuable in a larger sense, like to my immediate community and to the greater good and things like that, that I was always sort of framing as what I wanted in my previous life. Yes. (laughs) But now I feel like I'm actually doing that and it feels like who I am meant to be. And I was probably meant to be her at that point too, you know? Well, you had to be her to be you now. Yeah. And and now I can take all of those, the good parts of, of that person and who, who I was and what I learned and the skills that I honed, um, and put that where at the moment I feel it matters more with my children, with my family in the work that I do as a doula and in my teaching. And that's why I've held on to the teaching piece because, um, there is so much edification that can be gained in giving your energy and your expertise to others. Oh, that sharing. Yeah. yeah. And I think it really, it's really important to say this, um, you know, cause you and I both have described not liking versions of ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, pre-children in the past. And first of all, I must say, I knew you before you had kids <laughs> and you were as beautiful as you are now. You were younger. That's yeah. all you really were. And perhaps, you know, with youth comes some of those those attributes. And mm-hmm. I think um, when we're looking back, you and I, at our, at our previous versions of ourselves, we're using this microscope and we're focusing on the negative. Mm-hmm. And quite honestly, you know, the essence of Bethany hasn't changed. But your wisdom, your growth and your, you know, your acceptance, your permission, your values, those have changed for mm-hmm. sure and evolved. Yeah, I think that's a good way. That's a, thank you. <laughs> it's a very kind way to look at it. And I, I mean, well, I think we, we all, all need to be kinder to ourselves. Well, yeah, and yeah. I, I, I think most women don't love parts of themselves pre-children when they look at, especially the yeah. judgment, you know, there's a, we were just yeah. way more judgmental. And I think it's because we could be and because we <clears> thought we could, we thought we had control. Yeah. But honestly, we didn't. We just thought we did. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And that's so it. And I think that is what surfaces when you have kids is that you are forced to see, if not accept eventually, and work with the fact that control just it doesn't actually exist, (laughs) you know? Yes. And seeking it is just going to drive you insane when you uh, enter into this phase of life where it's so unpredictable. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's some memory you could share, some instance where it was a t- it was tough for whatever reason that involved your your child, both of your children. I mean, I think about it all the time. It's funny now because it was such a big deal to me in the moment, but now that I've lived four more years of having children past that, it's just a funny story, but about finding or trying to sort of hang on to my old identity while entering into this new phase of life with my first. Yeah. So when I went back to work, my son was really young and um, I was trying to do all the things, right? And be right. who I was and who I was becoming at the same time, which is just not possible. Yeah, it's like we're, <laughs> we're, we're becoming multiple personalities. Um, and the control thing about not wanting to miss anything in the old life, you know, when you yeah. step away from work and things like that. So I was at home with Phoenix, my oldest, who was probably like six months at the time, maybe a little older. And I was like trying to also have this like really essential work call. And I... <laughs> <laughs> There's a recipe for success. (laughs) Yeah, totally. So I was on this call trying to like wrangle a bunch of people and get things in order for some really big projects that were going on. And Phoenix reached into the recycling bin and found like a pop can or something and cut his finger on it. And at that moment, my cat... um, jumped off of our balcony onto our neighbor's balcony. We were living in a townhouse complex. And so I'm on the phone with my colleagues trying to be super professional while trying to like sort out my son and thinking through how I'm going to like climb over our our balcony to fetch my cat. Oh Oh my God. (laughs) Um, And obviously. And and all this time, and I can just imagine you're trying to hold up that persona on the phone Uh while you're trying to. 100%. And it was that moment where I was like, I can't do this. This is ridiculous. What are you doing? Like immediate prioritization of your child. And. Oh, I know. Right. right? So I was like 
you know what? I can't be on this call anymore. Um, I got to go, basically. So you just hung up. I didn't just hang, hang no, no, up, no, but obviously. essentially, yes, that was right. the energy. You, you, you put it Yeah, and then I called my husband. I was like, can you come home and get the cat off the balcony? And then Aww. Phoenix got him all sorted. And it was just one of those sort of where I look at it now. I'm like, my life is that all the time, you right. know? Yes. <laughs> but it was such a big deal when I was like trying to be all things rather than now we're not trying to be anything right. but what well, I now, am. Now you, know? you could say, oh, hey guys, um, you know, my son caught himself, you know, like there's something about yeah. that early stage where you, you're trying to save face. Yeah. In this way where you don't Nobody want anyone cares. to think you're overwhelmed <laughs> for a moment. You would never think to say to the work call, um, oh, hang on, guys, I'm here with my child and they he cut his finger because you'd think that's somehow admitting defeat in yeah, some like, way. Yeah, like how dare I try and work with my child? How right. dare I have a child, yeah. right? <laughs> I know, right? And yet what I've, I find in life is the more at ease I am with a si- situation, if I just present it authentically, then people aren't aren't going to be judgmental. Like to be able to say, oh, sorry, guys, um, I realize we're in the middle of this, but my son cut his finger and my cat is on a balcony. Mm-hmm. So I just need a moment here. Keep keep the meeting going. <laughs> I'm going to put myself on mute, you know, yeah, and they'd and probably th- laugh and it would be fine. Right. And that's something that comes with perspective and yeah. experience and age. Well, and honestly, the older that I get, the less I care about anything. But it I love it. You know what I mean? The more Carrie you care the, about other things and the less you care about anything, I know exactly yeah, what Yeah, right? Like, I don't care about things like judgment from others or about, mm-hmm. like, doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing all the time or, you know? I but think I, it's pride because that was mm. the word that came to my brain about 30 seconds ago when we were talking about it. It's like, we're still attached to our pride yeah. <laughs> when our children are first born and they just slowly chip it away. <laughs> Yes, which is you beautiful, know, right? It is like, good. I don't want to be prideful. Thing. I don't yeah. want no. that part of me to be like the default. Mm-hmm. And your kids force you there. And I mean, that's how it felt for me. Maybe it's really easy for some people. but <laughs> Well, your, your, your children certainly impose it upon you. And I mean, I mm-hmm. think if you're a, a wise and introspective and person open to learning then it impacts you. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously everybody parents differently, but the people that want to come on this podcast generally are the people who who are thoughtful and introspective and want to get better and, and yeah. somehow find a way to be the best version of themselves they can be as mothers, right? Yeah. And that's the hardest part. I think we can't be the best version of ourselves as a mother if we're still hanging on to that pre-mother persona. I think that's why I personally feel like a different person. Yes. Is because I hold myself to different standards. Not that they're lesser or more. They just have to be different. And that's the process for me has been learning how to find my value with those standards rather than the standards that I lived by before. I think the way most of us function is we try to do the best with where we're at. You know, the Bethany pre-kids did her best in the environment she was in. And quite frankly, in the world of music, you've got to be competitive. You've got to be comparative. Mm -hmm. You've got to be kind of take no prisoners because that's the secret to success. If you're kind about it, and you always were. And so you're now that same person as a mother in the sense that, I know we're saying we're different people, but you're, you're bringing the same recipe of Bethany that makes you do the best you can with what you have, Mm -hmm. right? So no, you don't need the competitiveness. You don't need the edginess. That's terrible in parenting, right? (laughs) Yeah. But, but that, that, that desire to be the best you can be in any scenario you're in. I mean, that is why you've done so well in career as a mother in athletics, you know, with basically whatever you've taken on. I guess if you verbalize it. That's how I feel about it. You know what I mean? But that's only come that sort of acknowledgement of like, yes, I am doing well with the things that I'm focusing on now and the ways that I focus on them. But it took a long time to yeah. get to that point and a lot of help. I always joke that people drawn to the arts are just people that need a vehicle to be super critical of mm. themselves because really, you know, it's yes and yes, I'm doing great. Or yes, that was, that was, I, I feel really good about that performance. Or I really feel really good about where I am as a mother now. And I want to improve here and here and here and here. And yeah. so it's like, 
I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at now. And how do we allow ourselves to want to seek improvement without it being, you know, shitting on ourselves? Yeah. And it's such a hard balance. I mean, there's no finish line. No. And for people who are, I mean, for myself, who's very sort of task and goal oriented, that is hard. And that's why you end up creating all the in-between tasks and goals of what progression looks like. And I say it to my students all the time too. You're going to hear all the hits <laughs> from my <laughs> lessons. <laughs> um, just That's that good. when well, I, cause it is, it, this is a life approach. And I yeah. find that in my lesson as well. It's an approach to life, approach to parenting, approach to relationships. They're all, the, it's all the same. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you're being authentic, right. And, and that you're trusting your wisdom and your experience and what you have to offer which takes a while. <laughs> but what I was I was going to say is what I say in my lessons all the time is when students are kind of like, I didn't practice because I already know the song or whatever that is. And mm-hmm. being in a loving and encouraging way saying like, there's always more that you can yes. look at. And I always say, I have done so many auditions and so many performances. There is only one that I have ever left and been like, I wouldn't change anything. One in all of them. Yes, yes. Right? Absolutely. And it's not a bad thing all the time. Do you know what I mean? Well, no, it's, it helps it's human you grow nature. and it helps you, um, it helps you maintain some humility and also be open to learning and new perspectives and be malleable and flexible in your interpretation of things. And it sort of gets rid of, it can get rid of, um, stubbornness right Mm -hmm. of like i or or sort of absolutism of well i know how to do this yes and you sure you can know how to do things oh ego yeah that kind of encompasses everything that i'm trying to say um you can you can know that you've done a good job but couldn't there be another way to experience it or try it or that maybe isn't better and what does better even mean i did the air quotes again (laughs) (laughs) no i love the air quotes you're making sense no one needs to see them, but um. yeah, um, you know, like what is what is better or good or even bad mean, really? But yeah, I, I love it when people talk about there really is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. There, yeah. it, there just is. I love what you're describing to your students. I think those are really wise words because basically you're you're kind of talking about unconditional love. Which means I accept myself for where I'm at or my child. You know, I accept myself and love what I've brought. But I also recognize I am a flawed, imperfect human. And I'm okay with that. And I'm going to love everything. I'm going to love the flat note that I sang. Or I'm going to love that, you know, I let my cat escape onto the balcony (laughs) because I wanted so badly to prove that I could be a working mother. You know, because unconditional love doesn't mean a good feeling. It means it's it's about an acceptance of all. Yeah. T- totally. And there is nuance to that. Whereas deciding how you feel about something that you've created or performed or said to your child or, you know, observed in your own interaction with the world. I'd love to hear about some of your parenting experiences these days. Like what are, what are the things that uh, challenge you the most with Mm. your household, with all, all Y chromosomes and and a three and uh, no, two and five-year-olds. Those are challenging ages. That it is proving to be the case. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think still those sort of like surges of needing things to be a certain way. Um, like for instance, yeah, so I can be specific about that, <laughs> like mm, needing to make sure that my kids eat vegetables oh, every God. day or, you know, that kind of stuff yep. where, or like making sure that every day is like so fun and exciting for them. And mm. that I am always living up to expectations. Yeah. So. My own expectations yep. for sure. Yep. Um, and I think as a person who knows that I need time alone and space to be able to continue functioning, um, Mm. to recharge and to process my thoughts and emotions. And in this stage of life, you really don't have that. Certainly to the extent that you ever did before. But if you're going to have it, you really have to make it happen. So I find myself 
often getting sort of triggered by little things. Like yesterday, I took my boys to um, the Provincial Park in Bread Creek. Oh, yeah. And we were like, my son, my older son, really wanted to like make a fire and have s'mores. And we brought the dog. So I was like, we have to go out a walk first to let the dog just like burn out some energy. And everyone was happy when he started. But like halfway through, of course, my two-year-old doesn't want to walk, but he doesn't oh. want to go in the sled. And he also doesn't want to be carried. Oh, God. But we need to get back to the fire pit so I can fulfill my promise of making a fire and having s'mores yes. to my older one. And it's just been a lot of that lately. So how do you serve them both at the same time? It's, oh, it's, my yeah, God. It's getting trickier for sure. Yeah. Um, because those things are really difficult for me to let go of because I feel that they reflect on me, right? I'm not fulfilling my promise to my child. But then if I'm like forcing my other child to do something he doesn't want, like he wants to stay and sit in the woods and like, that's also wonderful. But now I'm getting frustrated about that, you know, and like letting that out to my kids and it just spirals sometimes. Well, because it's an impossible situation. And, you know, it's funny, I I just had an interaction uh, with my kids around um, them, you know, at 21 and 19, they're trying to work together on something and they were at each other and frustrated And listening to what one of them had to say, it just took me back to those times where I I remember I had this goal as a youngest of four growing up in Generation X where, you know, hands off parenting, like we figured it out. There was no one was going to try and be fair. And that's just how they parented. This is not a criticism. It's like if I cried the loudest, then I was the one who'd get in trouble. You know, there was Mm -hmm. no like thought of the kind or fair or, or whatever. Yeah. But anyway, um, I really wanted to be there to support my children through those moments of discord mm-hmm. and uh, those, those moments of challenge where one of, I didn't want one of them to feel less important than the other. And, you know, I was so ready to be present and, and, and to be there for them. And I swear just about every scenario felt impossible. Like, it'd be like one wanted to watch Barbie and one wanted to watch G.I. Joe. Where's the middle ground? There's no middle ground. It was, it was literally impossible. It's not like in a boxing ring where it's, you know, there are certain guidelines and rules and there's a clear person who's been wronged and a person who's been right. Yeah. Right. It's almost never that. Yeah. And you think it's going to be before you're doing it, right? No, it's (laughs) not at all. You think, you think like, oh, I'm going to be the adults and be able to rationally sort everything out and take care of everyone's feelings and everyone's going to be happy and move on with their day. But it's never like that because your kids are little people. They're complicated emotional beings. Well, and what (laughs) is the resolution? So you're a mother, you're the mother, you have to be intact, strong and energized. Your dog needed exercise. Mm -hmm. Your two-year-old has little legs and and just a different little um, metabolism for cold and being out. He was done. Your five-year-old was ready to be intrepid. Who's who's the most important one there? I mean, quite frankly, I guess what anyone would say was the mom, because you have to be the one intact. <laughs> I was and, not intact in that moment. And that's oh, why I'm it sure. came to mind. Because I, yeah. and I, I try really hard to like repair after those moments. Oh. And so I was like apologizing to my older one being like, I'm sorry that I, my mommy so, is well, what did you so do? upset. Ex- I was just very obviously frustrated. Okay. So yeah. you were externally frustrated. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, if I look back, I can now see the gift of hindsight with adult children. I should, oh, there's that word. (laughs) I can see that had I put my needs first, I would have made everybody's life a lot easier Mm. because then it wasn't going to be about who do I choose? It's okay. What do I need right now to be the best version of me? Because that is what's going to be most important. I'm the one in charge. I'm the one driving. I'm the one who needs to make sure everybody survives this outing. Yeah. <laughs> Which, and then uh, things come out. Like I say things that I shouldn't in that. It should just be in my own brain. Like mm. maybe we should have stayed home kind of stuff, you know? Yes. Which is not about my kids, but what are they going to think? They're going to think it's about them, right? Because that's their whole world is their own experience. Right. So that's why I was apologizing to my son but then you think about it the rest of the day and analyze all the things that happened and i mean if you zoom you? out you yep. took i took my kids to the woods and one of them was cranky <laughs> <laughs> but 
it's yeah, like a you, whole thing. But you lost, you you didn't live up to your expectation mm-hmm. of this circling back because you were saying, what is what is the thing you struggle with? You set an expectation to be a perfect mother. Guess what, Bethany? You weren't perfect <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. And that's what you hated. You hated who you became yeah. in that moment because you weren't who you are aspiring to be. Yeah. But let's go back to this self-love and acceptance. So you had your imperfect note. Mm-hmm. You 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 had that moment. It was it's still beautiful. You made it beautiful. You gave your 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 children a real version of frustration and emotion and then you explained it and ex- expressed it to them and everybody probably felt quite loving towards each other very soon after that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I like you like yeah, except me about me towards myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's, it was I, yesterday. Yeah. So maybe that's why I'm still yeah, processing still... it. As my sons have entered new stages developmentally and are we're engaged with each other, which is wonderful. It's so fun to see them play together in ways that they never have before now that Lennon can sort of express himself a little bit more and they yeah. are interested in more similar things. Um, it has also increasingly triggered me because there's a lot more conflict, right? And a lot more – Yes. Um, because they have both have fully formed opinions – that they can express mostly, they're not often the aligned. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> and then God, it's yeah. my job to, like you were talking about, sort out, the, like, how do you decide what is more important? Like, you just can't. Yeah. But I think that's a really good way to reframe it. And, like, you need to make sure that your needs are met so that you can do your best in that situation, yeah. whatever it is. Because there's it's no so perfect. Tr- it's exactly what we were talking about before, right? Yeah. Like, we there's can't be no perfect. perfect. Yeah. Um, but I want to use the splashing game as an example because. I remember one would start splashing the other, the other would splash the other. And now one of them doesn't like the game. One's gotten splashed too hard. They're upset. So now I'm going, well, how are my, where do my needs even fit there? Hmm. Because I think like, again, maybe you and I are setting up this impossible scenario with the, well, what does mother need? Um, Maybe what do you say? No splashing. That's probably what I would say. Yeah. (laughs) So then the one that didn't want the splashing game got favorited or feels like yeah. they're the favorite. And the one that wanted their splashing game feels like this sucks. And then they feel resentful towards the other. And uh, Or maybe the answer is, you guys figure it out. I don't yeah. know. I mean, these are older children. Obviously, you can't do that with yeah, a two and a five-year-old necessarily. But that anecdote is so apt. Like, there is no right answer. And I suppose doing like navigating it with them, if you have the mental capacity and the space emotionally in that moment to help them understand at their own level yeah. what the other person is feeling yeah that's the best you can do i suppose totally you and know? i mean cuz yeah and, and like so splashing and your brag creek scenario one child is always going to be physically stronger mm-hmm. for most of their childhood and one is is going to be the you know the lesser and in need of more support and so there's never going to be a sense of balance there never yeah you know? Yeah. And one, it's funny because my older was the stronger one, but the younger, he was so generous and so kind and sharing with his little sister. She was a total bitch. <laughs> he'd give her like half a chocolate bar and then he'd be like, can I have half of yours? And she'd go, no. And she'd <laughs> stick to it. <laughs> oh my God. So, so that's the thing. Like the stronger, you know, there, there's never an innocent party fully. And there's never, yeah. there's always, you know, someone's always got more power over the other Mm -hmm. in some way shape or form which i guess is useful for them to learn how to navigate those dynamics in the world yeah but like you're not thinking about that in the moment when someone is crying because they've been splashed and and there are no answers (laughs) there are no answers so bethany yeah um i did create a song for you i was curious about what it would feel like because you are a musician and and I was wondering um, what would come out. Uh, but I got to say, it actually ended up being really easy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and how it's funny because how it started is not how it continued. And because um, I was thinking of your calm, you know, warm presence. And I was very clear, calm, strength, and passion. Hmm. Those were the things that I that surprised me. This The passion and the strength. Not surprised me about you, but... That came out and I went, wow, where's this coming from? 
And then when I listened and played it, I was like, well, of course, this is Bethany. So Mm -hmm. here you go. I feel like I'm gonna cry. It's it makes, so beautiful. It makes me cry. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it. I don't know why, but it moves me in a way that um, there's something about this song. There's something about this the strength and the passion. It's just really beautiful, like you. It's not me. I can't explain it. Well, I know what you it mean. It just. I just play. Yeah. You, yeah. and that's what comes out. So I, I do, I'm really enjoying working on this one. Yeah, no, it's so beautiful. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so now I want you to talk a little bit about uh, your career because uh, you you have a few different things on the go, which are just so cool. And um, I think it's wonderful that you were able to separate yourself from the music, come back to the teaching, but at the same time expand into this, you know, guiding and he- not healing, but I guess it's a one. It was for me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, your journey as a doula has been a healing experience for you, but also just supporting women, I think, is such an important place for you to be. Mm -hmm. I had had an experience in the birth of my first son that was traumatic for me in that it was a taking away of my um, control. Like the first like tangible instance of that was the birth of my first son, which became medically complicated and was not at all what I wanted. And I had mm-hmm. always been able to achieve what I wanted. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I was going to yeah. say, said, said you and every other first time. Mother. 100%, <laughs> which, which I quickly learned yeah. um, as I began having conversations with yeah. friends and, and people that I encountered who were also doing it for the first time. Um, and I just felt like, I remember I was in the bathtub <laughs> And I had this moment where I realized that I could have used some sort of support from someone who was just on my team and understood what I wanted and could help me navigate the changes. Yeah. Not necessarily ch- help me hold on to what I wanted and make sure it happened, but to navigate the changes. Wow. Um, and, I love that. And I uh, sort of in that moment was like, that has to exist, right? That has to be a thing that people do. Yeah. And that's when I started to look into um, birth doulas. And the moment that I started sort of reading and researching about what it was, I just knew that I was called to um, provide that for other people. How I normally sort of start talking about what I do is the advocacy piece. And so uh, I did my birth doula training in 2020 and have been serving my community as a birth doula since 2020. So you can start working immediately after training, but I really wanted to do the certification piece for my own edification and understanding of what it is that I can offer. And it has been so beautiful and healing. And I have seen so many amazing things that I never even knew I could and felt sort of the transformative spiritual power of birth. Wow. That I felt less connected to in my own experience. Um, right. Is there a place people can find you or? Yeah. So I have a website. It's just bethanyyon.com. Perfect. <laughs> so for vocal lessons and for, opera singing and doula services. That's right. It's two pronged. <laughs> so you can find everything you need to know about me there. Bethany, thank you so much for joining me today. So many interesting and compelling points that you made. Thank you. It was a pleasure as it always is to chat with you. Wonderful. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you soon.
Well, what a great conversation. Uh, Bethany is just so wise and uh, she's really put so much thought into her journey as a mother and, you know, seeking the best way to honor her role and and to show that um, innate sense of responsibility and love for her children. It's no surprise that I ended up calling her song Reverent Determination because there is a reverence about her, uh, something I, I, I just felt uh, quite strongly. Um, anyway, so playing us out today is going to be Bethany's song, Reverent Determination. And remember, if you'd like to come on the podcast, just reach out. Don't be shy. I'll talk to everybody. And I'd look forward to writing you a song. So um, just look for me at margaretdahlberg.com. Reach out. Here is Reverent Determination. Thank you for joining me today. Have a great week. <laughs>